well and a very warm welcome to this AS level philosophy of religion revision session. I'm Ben Wardle and in this 90 minute video we'll be taking a look at the key ideas and themes on the AS level philosophy of religion course. From Plato and Aristotle to religious experiences and the problem of evil. I hope that we'll be able to cover it all in, in, in an informative and engaging way. Now, the first thing that you need to do is head down below and click on the links and make sure you get your copy of the revision resources. It's really important you print those off as quickly as you can and then we can get started. So make sure you pause the video get printing and then make sure you are ready with those resources. We'll then be able to work our way through a series of questions based on the key points that could come up on the exam. This is specifically designed for the OCR course, looking at 30 mark questions, requiring an equal balance of knowledge and understanding, and then evaluation of ideas. But whichever course you're doing, whichever uh, route you're taking on philosophy at AS level, hopefully there'll be some good ideas about the key themes that are explored on the course. And there is nowhere else to start but at the very beginning of philosophy we're going straight back to ancient Greece and two key fundamental thinkers Plato and Aristotle and the question we're going to be answering on these two individuals is asking whether Aristotle's understanding of the world is more convincing than that of Plato so first of all, let's set the scene, shall we? And let's have a really in-depth introduction to these two key, key figures in the history of Western philosophy. Now, at the very top of that resource sheet, I do hope you've printed it, there is a very, very famous photo, or should I say painting, sorry, of the scene of the school in Athens and depicted in the centre in red is Plato and next to him is his student Aristotle. And whilst they were both in the same place at relatively the same time, of course Plato that little bit older as the teacher first of all, they had very different views. So it's always fascinating to think that whilst Aristotle was a student of Plato, he sort of veered deeply off course and really disagreed with his teacher. So on the left in that famous uh, picture, we have got Plato and he is pointing upwards. And this is very, very symbolic in comparison to Aristotle, who is reaching out. And this is all about symbolising how we attain knowledge. And probably the key distinction between Plato and Aristotle is their belief on knowledge. And remember, whenever we're talking about knowledge, we're talking about epistemology. That's that discovery and understanding of knowledge. And for Plato, knowledge is all about rationalism. Everything is known a priori. And by that, what we mean is that we find any truth out through thinking and reasoning. It's a priori. It's prior to any experience. So you can attain truth. You can attain knowledge through thinking and rational reasoning and reflection. This is in contrast to the Aristotelian notion, which is that all information, all knowledge is gained through empiricism. And empiricism or empiricism is all about using our experiences and our senses to attain knowledge. So, for example, it's like looking at the world, it's observing things we can then attain knowledge about them. And for Aristotle, in that empirical sense, all knowledge is attained a posteriori. And that means we can conclude things, we can know things after or post observation. So whereas with Plato, it's all a priori, it's prior to any experience or um contact and communication with the world. It's all about that rational reasoning and reflection. For Aristotelian thinkers, you've got to be using your senses. You've got to be out there in the world exploring and understanding things. Now, this has really, really serious consequences for both of these key philosophers because Plato rejected this idea of the body. And he said, no, 
don't you dare trust your body. Plato, as we'll see when we get onto a bit of muddy and mind, uh, mind dualism, he was very, very clear that the body is a source, here's a quote, a source of endless trouble for us. And he saw the body as a prison. And I'm sure you've been taking a look at the analogy of the cave and the idea that we're sort of trapped in this physical world. And then there is this other realm, if you like, this soul that we have trapped within us that comes from the realm, the realm of the forms. And the soul has all knowledge in it already. We possess within us all knowledge already, Plato believes. It's the idea that learning is remembering. We know everything because our souls, our souls have come from another realm. They've come from this realm of the forms where they've got all knowledge about all perfection. They've then been put into our bodies when we've been born and then they spend their lives wanting to escape the body. So this soul with all of this knowledge this immortal, imperishable, perfect soul trapped within the body, which Plato saw as this endless source of trouble for us. He saw this body as mortal, as perishable, as changeable. And then you've got this soul within us, trapped within us, that is desperate to get back out of this body, which is holding it prisoner, and to really reveal to us that truth, that knowledge, that real wisdom. And then, of course, on the other side, you've got Aristotle. And he believed that instead of rejecting the body and saying it holds us back from true knowledge, you know, Plato was saying the senses deceive us. We can't trust anything they tell us. You know, there are different things that we look at and we disagree. So I might see it as blue. Someone else might take a different perspective. He was saying we cannot trust our senses. They cannot be accurately relied upon to give us the right information. They deceive us. And so we can never know truth, never know knowledge through them. But Aristotle, you have to use the senses. He devised a theory of four causes. And it's through our senses, using empiricism, that we can know the four causes of everything. And it's through using your eyes, through exploring the things, to actually looking at them a posteriori, getting stuck in in the world, using those senses to actually understand things that Aristotle believes we can know anything. So let's take a look at those four causes proposed by Aristotle, shall we? And there are two wonderful quotes from Aristotle. The first one is, and I quote, men do not think they understand a thing until they have grasped the reason why. So we want to know why things happen and the only way we can understand them is by knowing why. And then the second one, we do not know a truth until we know its cause. So for Aristotle, it's very much about knowing why and knowing what the cause is. So he really wants to delve into things, if you like, and get a really good understanding. So let's take a look at his theory of four causes. And he believed that everything in existence have four causes. We can apply this theory, this idea of four causes to everything. And the first one of these is the material cause. And this is literally what something's made from. So if you think of a house, what's it made from? You know, the bricks, the cement. You know, I'm not a builder, but the, the basics that make it up, the materials. So the material cause, very simple. What materials, what key components physically make something up? We then have the efficient cause, and the efficient cause is the agent that makes something. So in the case of the house, it's the builder. Who is the agent acting to take those materials and actually turn them into that object or that item in existence? We then have a formal cause, and this is also known as like its imminent shape. So it's how we recognise something. And form, so formal, Form, that form bit is the essence. So what is it that defines that thing? So when we're looking at something and we say, that's the house, how do we know it's the house? What is sort of the template, the outline, the image that that object represents? So like a chair, how do we know it's a chair? What is the outline, the template, the formal cause that identifies that object, that thing, as what we're saying it is? 
And then finally, we have the final cause. And this is where Arist Aristotle's idea of telos comes in. For Aristotle, everything has a telos, a purpose. So everything in existence has some sort of telos or purpose to fulfill. And Aristotle believes that there are two states. OK, there is a state of potentiality and actuality and potentiality is where something is waiting to fulfill its purpose. So it's got potential. And then actuality is what everything is moving towards. Attaining a state of actuality is the telos of everything. Everything needs to fulfill its purpose. And to achieve that state of actuality means something has achieved its purpose. It has achieved what it's actually there to do. It's no longer with the potential to do it. It's actually done it. So, for example, a house, perhaps it's telos, its final cause is to provide a home. Or for a person, Aristotle would assert that it's all about achieving eudaimonia. And that is achieving what is highest in your nature. Because Aristotle was very big, and we're talking thousands of years ago, bless him, he was very big on happiness. He said, and I quote, happiness is the meaning and purpose of life, the whole aim and end of human existence. So for that human individual achieving eudaimonia, so achieving what is highest in your nature, fulfilling your purpose, that's what brings happiness. And that is what gets you to fulfilling your final cause, to fulfilling your telos to attaining that actuality, if you like. Now, he believed that everything starts in that state of potentiality, except one thing. There is one thing in the whole universe that is in its state of actuality. Even the universe is still changing. He basically believes that everything changes because it's in a state of potentiality and it wants to move to that state of actuality. So that explains all change. Everything's always changing. Why? Because of this state of potentiality moving to actuality. But he believed there is one thing and one thing only that is already in that state of actuality. And that is Aristotle's prime mover. Because Aristotle said that nothing can come from nothing. Your key Aristotelian quote there, if you remember nothing else, please, please remember that Aristotle said nothing can come from nothing. So what does he mean by this? He means that, well, we've got this whole universe and I've got a theory of four causes. And he says, you know, that house can't just come there. Nothing can come from nothing. And he's saying, well, look, I've got my building. Obviously, he wouldn't because in ancient Greece, they don't think they had mansions. But you're getting the idea. And he would have said, well, look at the house. It's not just come from nothing. You know, there's been materials. There's been an efficient cause. Someone's had to make it. It's got a purpose. But he's thinking, well, this can't just all happen overnight. This hasn't come from nowhere. And he said, well, look at the universe. What on earth has caused the universe? Because nothing can come from nothing. It must have some sort of cause, some sort of creator. And he said, there must be a mover which moves without being moved, eternal and a substance. He said, there must be a mover which moves without being moved, eternal and a substance, because he looked at the world and he said, all of this change, everything's in motion, everything's happening, there must be something at the very start of this that started the whole thing off, that caused the universe, and he saw that as the prime mover, this unmoved mover, a mover which moves without being moved. Bit of a tongue twister, I know. And you may be recognising this idea. It's a key idea in St Thomas Aquinas' thinking. We'll be talking about his cosmo mo cosmological argument very, very shortly. But it really important. it's really important to understand about this Aristotelian prime mover. And to note it's in a state of actuality. It doesn't actually do anything because it's, act it's in a state of actuality. So it doesn't need to change or engage, it does not engage with the world, it simply exists as a final cause. The whole universe is moving towards, if you like, this prime mover. It's about being the final cause, moving towards it, as opposed to being some sort of active force 
in the world. So what about Plato? What did he think? Well, he believed in a form of the God. And you're going to see a lot of comparisons with the prime mover and the form of the God and a lot of Judeo-Christian thought. So the monotheistic religions take a lot of inspiration from Plato and Aristotle in their ideas about God. Because the form of the God for Plato, like his realm of the forms, is the source of all goodness in the world. So, for example, in his analogy of the cave, you might be thinking of the sun. It's the source of all goodness in existence. So there is, for Plato, one source of goodness. And this is where we get all those key ideas that he was so passionate about. Things like justice, truth, beauty. He saw there being one fundamental source of all goodness. And of course, with somebody who believes in God, that might resonate a little bit. The idea of a form of the good, a source of all goodness, like God, maybe, to a Christian, for example. And so Plato believed that once you can understand the good, you will be illuminated in all knowledge and understanding in the world. He said the good, it illuminates everything, that knowledge of the good is the highest knowledge a human is capable of of attaining and achieving. So let's quickly just take a look at this theory of forms from Plato, because he said that we have a form, in this realm of the forms, there is a perfect copy of everything. So obviously there's a perfect goodness, the form of the good, but then there's a perfect copy of everything, like a template, there's a perfect chair. And it is knowledge of that in our souls, of course our souls know everything, learning is remembering, within our souls, we have that blueprint, if you like, for everything. So that is how we recognise things. So Plato would say, you know what a chair is because you've got that template in your soul. You know what a tree is. It's all stored in there. So what about this theory of thought? Forms, what can we say? First of all, it does explain why we all recognise the same essential elements and characteristics in something. They're outside, the outside time, they're eternal, they're unconditional based on what's going on around us. We've all got that essential knowledge within us. It also helps us to understand why there's imperfection in the world, because it has a source, the form of the God, and it's from that that all goodness comes. It also encourages to question the world around us. Plato very, very clearly said, you know, the senses deceive us. The body is a source of trouble for us. So it gets you to question things. You don't take what you see as just accepted. You're always questioning things. And that's a good thing. Um, and it gives us a very clear, objective sense of goodness. You know, that is one source of goodness and that clearly defines for you morality. It gives you that very clear sense of what is right and what's wrong. However, what about the weaknesses? The massive thing for Plato, of course, is there's no proof. Whereas Aristotle, and here's his strength, is all about using your evidence around you from actually using your senses and having knowledge as a subject of your inquiry. For Plato, you don't have that. It's based on reasoning. So you've just got to accept that there is a realm of the forms. There's no proof that there's a form of the good. It's all about just accepting it. And for a lot of people, especially today, that rationalism is just hard to do. Uh, the form of the good is an example of absolute morality. He is saying that there is just one source of goodness. That's unquestionable. There is the form of the good and that is the absolute source of all goodness. So it very clearly, as we said, defines right and wrong. And here's where we can use Aristotle to criticise Plato because Aristotle said that good is not something corresponding to a single form. So he said goodness is not corresponding to just this one single form. So Plato's idea there is one form of the good, the source of all goodness, is not something an Aristotelian thinker would agree with. The idea of absolute morality of one source of goodness is actively challenged by Aristotle. It also seems unlikely that there is a single uh, form of everything. So it's literally a case of Plato believes our souls have got information and understanding of a perfect copy of everything. So we're literally meaning billions of things. Is there a perfect slug? Has he got a copy of a perfect iPhone 7? Has he got a perfect nail? You know, where on earth do we stop with this idea there's a perfect copy somewhere in this supernatural realm of everything. Uh, and of course, the argument criticises the senses and the body. 
that's quite dangerous. You know, it's thanks to our body that we are where we are today. Of course, we couldn't exist without our body. We could not exist without our senses. And of course, today, a lot of materialists, such as Richard Dawkins, who we'll be exploring in just a minute, would say, we are just our bodies. There is not a soul. So this whole platonic notion of this supernatural soul realm and this soul within us is questioned and challenged today more than ever before. And finally, why should the realm of forms matter to us? If it's outside of us, if we are held back by our body, why should we be concerned with this you know, supernatural realm that exists out there if we can't access it and do anything with it anyway? So plenty of criticisms, plenty of questions. Another one comes from Karl Popper. And he said that Plato, we basically said Plato is quite insecure. Plato is desperate for certainty. And because he can't find that in the world, the world is always changing. Aristotle completely accepted that. He said, yeah, it's in a state of potentiality. There's always going to be change. Plato saw that, that simile and he said, no, I don't like this. So I'm going to create this form of the good that gives me this certainty and this grounding that, you know, it's not changing. And that is a sign of insecurity, perhaps. So that is what Plato's belief is founded, founded upon. And what about Aristotle and Aristotelian thought? There's one key criticism of Aristotle and his idea of the prime mover. And it is a logical fallacy. It's a fallacy of composition. And it's a really, really interesting idea. And the key figure around this is Bertrand Russell, a really recent philosopher. And he said that just because you can observe a cause in certain things, so like I know the house has a cause, or I know that the cup of tea has a cause, has a creator, has a maker, there is no reason whatsoever to suppose the universe as a whole must have a cause. So whilst you can empirically prove or empirically prove that certain things in this world have a cause, you cannot prove the universe as a whole has a cause. The prime mover is not an a posteriori argument, it's a priori. You cannot prove it, it's based on reasoning and rational reflection. So we could say, well, Aristotle, you're making a fallacy of composition uh, mistake here. You're saying that just because certain things have got a cause doesn't mean everything has to have a cause. So that is a key critique. You know, not everything does have to have a telos or a final cause just because certain things that we observe do. And of course, you could say he puts too much reliance on the senses. You could use Plato to criticise Aristotle and say he's too dependent on the senses and some of his things are conflicting. They don't make sense. The idea of the prime mover, for example, that the prime mover is just the final cause. It does nothing. It's just there. What's the point of it? You know, there are lots and lots of questions that we can ask about both Plato and Aristotle. So we've spent quite a lot of time just taking a little introduction to them as key thinkers. And I think that's nice because we've got that grounding now to go forward, knowing that they are our two key figures in the philosophy of religion. So we're going to take a look now at ideas around the soul. This is a really interesting idea of thought. And our key question here is to assess whether dualism is a convincing approach, is it convincing, can we use it, does it make sense, to questions of body and soul. So let's get stuck in, shall we, because it's this idea that there are three, I'd say there are three key ideas here. We've got the idea of dualism, that there is a body and there is a soul, and they are separate, and our key figure there is Plato. He said the body is a source of endless trouble to us. And then he said the soul in the likeness of the divine. So we've got this immortal, imperishable soul and this very permanent holding us back body. We've then got the materialists spearheaded by Aristotle all those years ago and today by Richard Dawkins, who say there is no separate soul. You've just got this physical body. And then we've got like a new niche market, if you like, if we're talking business. And it's where you've got this idea of a profound union between the body and the soul. And for me, the Catholic Church is our key source of wisdom here. The Catholic Church is very keen to stress there's a soul, there's a body, but you can't separate them. They're profoundly united. So the Catholic Church would be more in, I suppose, the materialists with uh, Aristotle and Richard Dawkins, 
perish the thought there because Plato was very, very extreme in his thinking. And he did have support. René Descartes in the Enlightenment, for example, was very, very clear. He thought the mind is wholly dependent from the body. But we're going to examine it now. So let's take a look at Plato and Descartes and this idea of dualism. And dual, duo, means two. So it's the idea that we are two substances. And when we say two substances, I mean two. Not connected, not linked, two. One of them is the body, the physical body. The other is the soul. And for Plato, you've got that clear distinction, as we've said, between this body, which has no purpose, it just limits us, it holds us back, it deceives us, and this soul, which is imperishable, immortal, it's been put into our body, it knows everything, the soul knows everything, it's perfect, it's come from this grand metaphysical source, and it just wants to escape back there. So Plato, very, very clear, there is your body, there is your soul. A little bit later on down that line, in the Enlightenment period, we've got René Descartes, and he said that the mind is wholly dependent from the body. He said, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. It is through your thinking and it's through that rationalism that you can know things. He, like Plato, was questioning the world around him. He was saying, how can I rely on my senses? These things deceive me. I can't know that's true. The only thing I can be sure of is that I exist. And I only know that I exist because I can think. So he, like Plato, was very keen on this idea of rationalism and personal internal thinking as opposed to your external sensory world. So that platonic notion that the body is holding us back, that you've then got this immortal soul. How would that affect your views on life after death then? You've of course got this very, very clear idea that you are going to live because Plato said the soul is immortal and imperishable. So whilst we can all see that the body dies, that's not an issue for Plato. It means the soul can then leave the body and return to the realm of the forms. It can return to the universe of perfection, if you like. And of course, we could say a lot of Christian monotheistic teachings are influenced by this. The idea that when the body dies, there's this separate soul that leaves the body and lives on for eternity. So it is an idea many people would support. And the Descartes uh, assertion as well, that the mind is wholly dependent from the body, there is this clear distinction, is quite a popular view. However, we need to pull him up there because Gilbert Ryle came along a little bit later after Descartes and said, honey, you've got it all wrong. You're making a category error. What is a category error, I hear you ask? Let me tell you. Gilbert Ryle said that by separating the mind and the body, René Descartes is making this category error. He's categorising these two things as separate when really they're the same thing. And he used the example of a university. He said, you go around a university and you look at the lecture hall, you look at the student accommodation, you might look at the restaurant, and then you stand and you go, so where's the university? And he said, well, you know, you're in the university. These are all parts of what we call the university. And in the same way he was saying, you can't say that there is a mind and then there is a body. You're making a category error. You're categorising them wrong. Really, they all make up the same entity. And this is a word I love. He takes a holistic approach. He says, you have got the whole. So holistic means whole. You've got to look at it as a whole. So you've got this mind, you've got this body, but they're not separate. They're one thing. You take that holistic approach and look at them together and that is what makes up the human being we're not isolating them like Descartes tried to do they are one so that was Gilbert Ryle's fight back if you like at the uh, Descartes thinking quite literally on the subject so then if we move along a little bit to our materialists and a materialist would be very very clear that Plato is wrong there is not this separate soul this like ghost-like soul which is just staying in our body for a bit, that's come from somewhere else, in here for a bit, and then it's off. They would believe very, very strongly that you just have your physical body and that's it. So the idea that we have the separate soul, no. Richard Dawkins, for example, rejected, he's a key biologist, he rejected the notion of this separate soul and he said, 
That's what we call soul one, this very traditional platonic idea of a separate soul. He instead believed in what he called soul two, which is like a modern, modern thought on what the soul is. It's the idea the soul is sort of consciousness. So the brain secretes consciousness. It doesn't have an external source. It's, um, it's oh, produced, produced, that's the word, produced by the brain. And he believed that the soul, soul is the label we ascribe to our creative thinking, to our higher level of intellectual, intellectual thought, to our emotions and our intense feelings. So we do have this very high level of thinking. You know, human beings have what we call the cerebral cortex, this outer layer on our brains, which adds this greater creativity, higher thinking, intellectual self-awareness. But Richard Dawkins would argue that's not because of a God or a supernatural force acting on us, but because that is evolutionary, what we have developed, because it has allowed us to survive. Having self-awareness, having creativity, having deeper cognitive processes and functioning for Dawkins is not about spirituality, but it's about evolution. It's about survival. It's what we've been given to help us survive as part of that evolutionary processing as opposed to having that acted on us or being given to us from some metaphysical supernatural source. Then you've got, really interesting, Aristotle. Because, of course, 2,500 years ago, Aristotle was very, very clear that he did not see the soul in the same way as Plato. So again, you know, we've got the rationalist, empiricist clash. You've got this prime mover, form of the good. And now we've got this clash over the soul. Can you imagine being in Greece when these two were at it? Lord above. So let's talk about Aristotle for you, shall we? And Aristotle is a key monist. He said, and maybe this sounds quite similar to what Gilbert Ryle was saying about Descartes. Let me know what you think. He said that it is meaningless as to ask whether the wax and the shape given to it by the stamp are one. So he was using, you know, an analogy he understood to basically say, how can you say that the soul and the body are different when they are one? He said the soul is what we use to describe the characteristics and attributes of the body. The soul is not some extra from somewhere else. It's just part of who we are. It's part of our character. It gives us characteristics. It provides us with our essence. It animates the body. But it's not some sort of separate thing. When the physical body dies, he believes that the soul will die too. The soul cannot survive death as it is inseparable from the body, whereas for Plato, of course, very, very distinct. So Aristotle as our key, key uh, ancient thinker, really, on that idea of monism, that the body and the soul are one. OK, now, a really interesting uh, materialist who believed that the body and the soul are one is John Hick. Now, he was a key Christian thinker. And whilst he believed that the body and the soul are one, he believed in life after death because he believed that in heaven, your whole body would be replicated. His replica theory is based on this idea that the body and the soul are one, so both will be replicated in the afterlife. So he's a key example of where a religious individual does not believe in dualism, but believes that the whole body and the soul, which is inseparable, will be replicated in an afterlife. So he sort of goes against what we might stereotypically expect, that if you're going to believe in life after death, you've got to believe in that separate body and soul. He didn't. He believed they are inseparable and that well, they will both be replicated in an afterlife. And just while we're talking about religion, it might be nice to drop into any answers that the idea of life after death is very, very prevalent in Eastern cultures. I mean, like Buddhism, we'll see a lot of this idea of rebirth. In Western cultures, we see a lot about eternal life in heaven or hell. So whenever you are talking about the soul, don't write it off completely because on both sides of this world, on all corners of this world, there are ideas, there have been ideas about rebirth, reincarnation, about heaven and about hell. So people do think there is something in us that will transcend our physical death. So something nice just to drop in there, perhaps. So 
when we are talking about religion, what can we say? The Catholic Church is a really interesting example. Uh, and their key thinker, St. Thomas Aquinas, provides us with a lot of food for thought on this. Because the Catholic Church would really follow in what Aristotle says. The Church teaching is that the unity of body and soul is so profound. If you remember one word, please let it be profound. The Catholic Church argues the unity of soul and body is so profound. The soul is the form of the body. So there is a soul, there is a body, but that union is profound. They are deeply connected. Um, and St Thomas Aquinas, the doctor of the church, said the soul is the first principle of life. So yes, we're all saying, hello, there is a soul. Definitely but, and that key point, whereas your platonic thinker would be saying they are really separate, you cannot unite them, for the uh, Aristotelian, for the Catholic, as we've seen, for these uh, monist materialist thinkers, it's very much the idea that they are inseparable, that the union is profound, that the soul is part of the body, remember that idea of a category error, and that they are not two completely distinct entities, they are one. And remember, always be thinking, what does that mean for life after death? If you don't believe they're separate, can you believe in life after death? Um, and where would a soul come from? Where is the soul going? And what then is the purpose of the body when we're looking at in relation to those key ideas? We're going to move on to the arguments from observation now. And the first one is the design or teleological argument. Three key thinkers here. We've got St. Thomas Aquinas and his arrow and archer. We've got William Paley and his watch analogy. And we've got F.R. Tennant and his modern day design argument, which is all to do with the anthropic principle. And I want us to look at whether, how, how you'd answer this question, whether there is design in the universe. So if you were given the statement, there is no design in the universe, discuss how would you go about answering it. So our first key thinker really is William Paley. And his scenario, I'm sure you know it well by now, you're walking on the heath, there you are, and you stumble across a watch. And he said that it is inevitable that you will instantly make the inference that is the necessity of an intelligent creator the necessity of an intelligent designer you wouldn't think it's just there by chance it's just happened to fall into place that watch with its specific purpose and its specific reason for existing has to have had an intelligent designer and that is in a nutshell the teleological argument that this world like the watch is so intricate, it is so well designed for its purpose to sustain human life, it can't just have happened by chance, there has to have been an intelligent creator, an intelligent designer, planning, constructing, crafting it to make it as so perfect as it is. Um, and we use that analogy, the idea that Paley has is that you take the watch and then you apply that to the world. So if a watch has to have a designer, if something like a watch has to have a designer, then just look at the world. The world must also have that designer, that force which is acting upon it to create it. It can't have happened by chance. If a simple watch couldn't happen by chance, then surely a whole world that can't have happened by chance either. So what are our thoughts? Aristotle, of course, said that nothing can come from nothing. So the idea has got, you know, credibility. The watch didn't just appear. So how could a universe? Um, and the idea from William Paley, the watch must have a maker. And so the necessity of an intelligent creator in the world as a whole. And the key bit of his argument, transferring it from that watch to a world, he says, Every observation made concerning the watch may be repeated concerning the eye. It's about that application of the analogy to use that as evidence. Evidence from observing the watch to the world as a whole having a creator. There's a lot of criticism of this, as you can imagine. David Hume, born in 1711, a key Scottish thinker, uh, he was very passionately not impressed with what Paley had to say. He described it as a very weak analogy, liable to error and uncertainty. He said you just cannot compare a watch 
to a world. And he used an example that was talking about comparing the circulation of blood in frogs to the circulation of blood in humans. Basically, they're very different. And he said, you can't make this comparison. It's too out there. It's too ridiculous for you to be trying to compare a watch, which has clearly been made by a man, and the whole universe, which we're just a small part of. So he was just like, no, it's not working. He also said a lot. So he's got a lot of criticisms of this teleological argument. He was saying, well, if the world is so amazing, why just one God? He said, we need a watchmaker to make one watch. Surely a whole world would need many deities, many gods. He then said, well, actually, when I look at the world, is it so perfect? He said, I'm looking at this world and I'm seeing the suffering. I'm seeing the despair, you know, the flaws. This is a really flawed design. And so he said, well, how can you claim it is an omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent God that has created it? He's thinking, surely it's the work of a senile, so of an old age, or of an apprentice God. Surely that perfect God could not create this world because the world's not perfect. So then it's got to have been a different God to this Christian notion of this perfect, ideal God. And John Stuart Mill, he was a really, really interesting man as you'll know him, for his utilitarianism, said nature kills. So he was not impressed with nature. And he said that we live in a designedly imperfect world. So this world is perfect. So if it was designed, who designed it? Because it's not perfect to him by any stretch of the imagination. He saw the barbarity of nature, the cruelty, the suffering. Really interesting to bring in here a key thinker, Leibniz. I think that's how you say his name. It's spelled a bit weird. L-E-I-B-N-I-Z. There you go, write it down. And he said that we live in the best of all possible worlds. That's what he said. So that could support the design argument. We live in the best of all possible worlds. But how do we know? What are we comparing it, it to? And in the same way, talking about the design argument, what are we actually comparing this design to? How do we know it's so perfect? How do we know it's so incredible? Many people don't think it is. Then let's have a quick chat about Richard Dawkins. His name is going to come up time and time again. And he said very, very clearly that there is no watchmaker. He wrote a whole book about the idea of it being a blind watchmaker. He said the only watchmaker is the blind forces of physics. And he said natural selection is the blind watchmaker. He's very, very, very passionate about the idea. It's all about chance, mutations and evolution. And that doesn't, for him, have room for a designer because it's all about being random, all about being down to chance and these random mutations about natural selection, the forces of physics. So he said it's a blind watchmaker, the blind forces of physics, natural selection is responsible. And just on that note, um, Francis Crick, a key biologist, said that biologists must keep in mind that what they see was... Um, not designed, but rather evolved. So he said they are not compatible. Many thinkers will say they are. Pope Francis and Pope John Paul II have both spoken out, saying that evolution and the Big Bang Theory require a creator because who put those essential ingredients, who planned for natural selection and this process of evolution to take place. So they actually say, well, hang on, evolution and natural selection require an intelligent creator. There needs to be intelligence behind such a complex, incredible process. But others would very, very flatly reject the idea that there is some sort of God, some creator. Because of that idea of the flaws in nature, because the analogy is weak, and because natural selection and evolution is all about random things happening, not about a consciously controlled creator who's been there since the beginning of time. But let's quickly bring in Aquinas now. He was the arrow and the archer uh, analogy, and he said that some intelligent being exists which directs all natural things to their ends. This being we call God. So the idea that everything has to have something directing it, what's directing us and this universe, he'd say it's God, the arrow and the archer. The um, arrow can't just go on its own. Something's got to have started it off. And that point actually really nicely leads us into the cosmological argument, which is uh, Aquinas' forte, if you like. But very quickly, before we do, let me just add one more point on the teleological argument, the modern uh, teleological argument from F.R. Tennant, and that is the anthropic principle. And he asserted 
that we are at the center of this world this world is perfect for human life and he said that can't just be an accident god has to exist because for life to be you know this world to be so perfect for human life there has to have been some sort of creator guiding sculpting designing it all and so the anthropic principle requires an intelligent creator because otherwise how would human beings have survived in the way that we do in this world with humanity and all its interests taken account for but we're going to move seamlessly on nice little transition there onto the cosmological argument because this is St. Thomas Aquinas' forte. And I've got a nice quote, which I love from him, which I think really sums up his cosmological argument. So do listen up. He said, whatever is in motion must be put in motion by another. If that by which it is put in motion be itself put in motion, then this also must need be put in motion by another and that by another again. Keep it. But this cannot go on into infinity because then there would be no first mover and consequently no other mover. Seeing that subsequent movers move only in as much as they are put in motion by the first mover as the staff moves only because it is put in motion by the hand. Keep it here. Therefore, it is necessary to arrive at a first mover put in motion by no other. And this everyone understands to be God. And remember I said a little earlier, this has got a lot of that Aristotelian idea of a prime mover. The idea from St. Thomas Aquinas, there has to be a first mover. Because the cosmological argument is all about the ideas of a cause and effect. The idea that in the world around us, everything has a cause. Aristotle, again, nothing can come from nothing. Everything has a cause. And he wanted to know well, how can this go on forever? Infinite regression is the term we use to describe this process of going back in time again and again, infinitely progressing backwards, you know, cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. How can this just keep going on? Everything we observe has a cause. We, we just keep going back and back. How can this go on into infinity? He said, no, we can't. We have to move. We have to arrive at a first mover. Let me go back. This cannot go on to infinity. He said this infinite regression cannot just keep going back into infinity. So he said it is necessary to arrive at a first mover. So the start of the domino chain, if you like, put in motion by no other. And this everyone understands to be God. So the cosmological argument, key thinker, Thomas Aquinas, the idea that there is a God um, and that is because God has to exist. God is necessarily existent as the first mover of a chain in infinite regression. You can't just keep going back. You've got to necessarily arrive at a first mover. And that has to be God. God is the only thing powerful enough. The only thing that we could possibly understand as that individual figure that started off this whole chain of cause and effect. That started the universe and everything that exists within it so that's the key idea governing the cosmological argument now they are really really key with this exam about those key words so make sure you are aware of necessarily existent of infinite regression of those key terms of first mover as we look at the idea of the cosmological argument and the key thinker is thomas aquinas and he put forward a theory of causes and his argument is based upon what he describes as three principles. The first one is that something cannot be the cause of itself. Nothing can just cause itself. Not happening. He said something cannot become from nothing. So much like Aristotle said, nothing can come from nothing. It can't just spring out of midair. And he said there cannot be a series of cause and effect. So they are the three things that summarise this argument for him. A lot of criticism heading his way. Let me assure you, you're going to start off once again with David Hume because he's really quite critical of all of this discussion. And he said, why may not the material universe be the necessarily existent being? So he was saying, well, if there has to be this first cause, why are you saying it's got to be God? Why can't the universe itself be the necessarily existent being. Why can't we say, right, there was a big bang, that started it all off, and then there's cause and effect. Why, Aquinas, do you have to keep pushing it back a step? Why do you have to say, oh yeah, 
and that's God. Why not the universe itself as the necessarily existent being? He also said that you will find nothing but one great machine beyond what human faculties can trace and explain. So he said, look, you're looking at the world. You're not going to find this divine presence, this divine individual. It's a machine. We can't understand it. It's beyond our understanding. So why do you keep trying, Aquinas? That is what David Hume wanted to know. So Hume's not impressed, also not impressed is Bertrand Russell, he's back, bless him, and he said, I should say that the universe is just there and that's all. It's just there, that's all. No first mover, it's just there. Terry Pratchett, you may recognise his name, he is a very modern thinker, uh, and he said, in the beginning there was nothing which exploded. So he saw parodying Genesis there saying, in the beginning... There was nothing which exploded, the Big Bang. So this idea, again, that the idea of a God as creator is not compatible with the modern scientific notion. Pope Francis, John Paul II would disagree with you there. But that whole idea of cause and effect, is that compatible with these notions of a God? Uh, and on that idea of a fallacy of composition, again, we can return to Bertrand Russell. And his idea, the whole concept, of course, we derive from our observation of particular things. There is no reason whatsoever to suppose that the world as a whole has a cause. So just because um, this caused this in our world, so me dropping that pen, the cause of that is me dropping it. That doesn't mean that the world as a whole has to have a cause. Why not, as uh, Hume said, why not the world just be the necessarily existent being? Why can't we just accept it exists? Why is it a God? And then if we are talking cause and effect... Who caused God? And where's this cause and effect actually going to take us into the future? Really, really big questions to ask. We're going to move on to your arguments from reason now, which is a really interesting one. And it is Saint Anselm and his ontological argument. This is a very strange argument. It's really quite something to get your head around. But once you get there, it's quite interesting to be thinking about and reflecting on. So Saint Anselm, he was a former Archbishop of Canterbury, religious Christian believer. And he said that you could prove or explain that God exists simply through defining him. So let me quote what he said. And Anselm believed that you can use definition and predicates to literally define God into existence. So Anselm's ontological argument goes as follows. He said that we can all think God. We can all think God. We can all think of God. We can all imagine in our minds this idea of a God. He said, God, we imagine we can all, so even if you don't, he said the fool in the Psalms, even the fool in the Psalms has to conclude that God is a being than which nothing greater can be conceived. Uh, and he said that we can all think that we can all think of God as the being than which nothing greater can be conceived. We can all do that. And his point basically was. Well, if you can think that, then it means God does exist, because if you can imagine God exists as the greatest possible being than which nothing greater can be conceived, then God has to exist in reality. He said if you can imagine it, then that means he has to exist in reality, because if he didn't, there'd be an even greater being that exists. So if anybody can imagine, is going to imagine God as the greatest being, that means God then has to actually exist. Because otherwise, there's a greater being. To be the greatest being, to fulfil that definition, and key bit here, we are looking at definitions. To fulfil that definition as the greatest being, that use of the superlative, you can tell I do English language, can't you? That use of the superlative really means God has to exist not only in the imagination, in the understanding, but also in reality. He said, there exists a being than which nothing greater can be conceived, you can't think of anything greater, and it exists both in the understanding and in reality. So the idea that being able to understand God exists through the definition of God as that than which nothing greater can be conceived means that God has to exist in reality. So a lot of people 
would obviously be completely flummoxed by this, but they would say that what Anselm's doing is trying to defy God into existence, trying to use the definition of God to prove that God exists and recognize here that it is an argument from reason there is no proof it's not like the teleological argument going look at the wonder of the world look at the intricacy of the design look at the you know the anthropic principle and the fact we are here he doesn't care he's he could lock himself away in a room and not look at anything in the world and he just think that you would come to this conclusion through reasoning so like doing your maths equations gets you that answer he thinks you can do the same. You can define God into existence using this idea that existence is a predicate, that saying that God is the greatest possible being, meaning he has to exist both in the understanding and in reality, means that existence is used by Anselm as a predicate to prove God exists. Now, Gaunilo came along, and I do love Gaunilo because he thought, you know what? Come on, let's get a grip. So he said, right, we're going to apply everything Anselm you're saying to an island. So we're going to say, right, everybody can imagine that an island exists. Imagine, do it now, imagine your perfect island. We can all conceive that perfect island. And imagine what's on the island. You know, what's there, what food's there, what music's playing, what the temperature's like, what the beach is like. We can all do it. We can all picture it. We can all understand it. So if I say to you, right, well, you're imagining the greatest island that can be conceived, and you are. You're imagining the greatest paradise you can. And then I say, well, if you can imagine it as the greatest, then it has to exist both in the understanding and in reality, because otherwise it wouldn't be the greatest island. Now, the first thing you're going to say is, well, it doesn't. Just because I can imagine it doesn't mean it actually exists. You know, I'm imagining the greatest possible island than which no greater island can be conceived. And so it, it has to exist in both the understanding and in reality. You're thinking, no, it really doesn't. So Galileo was saying, come on, this is a really flawed idea. Not only because it just logically doesn't make sense. I don't imagine it as the greatest and then it comes into existence. That is not the relationship between language, thought and reality which is not possible, but what is also an issue is my greatest island is different to yours. Don't know what's on yours, but no, I wouldn't tell you what's on mine, but <laughs> what's on my island is not likely to feature on somebody who's passionate about rugby and sports cars, um, because that's not going to be on my island, let me tell you. So we, we've got a real distinction going on. You know, if I'm imagining my greatest island as having this, but yours is this, what about God? I can bet you that my idea of God is different to yours. You might see God as a Father Christmas figure. I might see God as more of a spirit. So whose is right? Which God actually exists? If it's all about how we imagine it, that thought, how is the reality? Are we saying that there are seven billion different gods, but all seven billion of us? Well, that completely contradicts Anselm's belief in a creator, one monotheistic God. So it's a really, really interesting thing where this idea of individual thought proving something, it's just not really working, if you like. Kant, Immanuel Kant, you'll know him well, also had a bit to say. He said that existence is obviously not a real predicate. You can give a chair different characteristics, so it might have a bag, it might have arms, it might have a certain colour, but just saying the chair exists doesn't exactly prove it exists. Existence is obviously not a real predicate. And then Ludwig Wittgenstein, really interesting uh, recent thinker, uh, well I say recent, in the last uh, couple of hundred years, he said that the limits of my language are the limits of my world. And basically, we can only articulate what we have words for. We are limited and constrained by the language we use. He said, all I know is what I have words for. So he was really interested in this idea of language games. And he, he thought, well, Anselm is using words, but do these words actually have meaning? Can we actually use them to, to prove something like this? We are limited by our language and our vocabulary. We, can, we think in words. We articulate ourselves in words. The way in which he's using words, is this actually working or is he playing language games? Is he just trying to prove something by saying something when words don't actually mean anything? You know, I could tell you to stop, but it doesn't mean you have to. The words are meaningless. So just by saying something, it's not got the power 
to define it into existence. So some really interesting ideas. We could also bring a bit of David Hume in. When couldn't we bring a bit of David Hume in? And he said that it, there is evident absurdity in pretending to demonstrate a matter of fact a priori. So the idea that trying to define God, to explain God without any evidence, not a shred of physical evidence, is absurd. You just can't do it. Why would you do it? And of course, we all think in different ways. We all process things in different ways. So it is a very inconsistent, flawed, you could say, argument, especially trying to use words in this way, as Gaunilo, as Wittgenstein, as Kant would say. However, a bit of support for uh, Anselm from Descartes. He's back, bless him. Um, and he used the example of a triangle. A triangle is literally triangle. It defines itself. And he said, well, you can do the same with God. We say that God is this perfect being to have perfection God has to exist because perfection means you possess every single quality. And if he didn't exist, then he wouldn't be perfect. So he has to exist because that ensures he ticks that box of perfection, of having every quality. Because we couldn't say, well, God is a perfect being and then say, oh, but he doesn't exist. If he's perfect, he has to exist because that would mean he's got all the qualities. He ticks all of the boxes. So a really interesting idea from Descartes there. We're going to leave the arguments about God behind there. I hope that's given you some good information. There is plenty more out there, so make sure you do complete your notes and get them as full as possible. But that's just a nice outline, I think. Time is money, time is money. So we're going to race on. And I want to talk about religious experiences now. Really, really interesting topic. And we're looking in particular at how William James looked at religious experiences um, and explained them. And he thought that an authentic religious experience, he was an American philosopher and psychologist, by the way, he thought an authentic religious experience is characterised by four key points. It will have passivity, ineffability, noetic quality and transience. Um, and through these, I'm going to explore all the different ideas that we have around religious experiences. So we're going to start with passivity. And passivity is the idea that in a religious experience, you are acted upon. You are passive. You play no role in it. And it sort of proves that it's come from an outside source. You don't bring it upon yourself. You're acted upon. And that would suggest that it is God that's acting upon you or a supernatural force because you've got no personal control. So that would maybe to a believer suggest, yes, so a religious experience proves God exists because you are being acted on, it's outside of your control. However, you could say, or a biologist might say, well, just because you've not brought it upon yourself doesn't mean it's divine in origin. For example, uh, Freud, Sigmund Freud, key father of psychoanalysis, he was very clear, not happy with religion, at all. He said religion is a neurosis of the mind. So he saw religion as an illness, as sort of a manifestation of subconscious, unconscious desires, projecting our childhood insecurities, etc., into this idea of a God. So he would say, well, if a religious experience, you know, is it a delusion? Is it hallucinations? Is it mental illness? It's not come from outside of you. It could be something like St. Paul on the road to Damascus, the uh, Saul to Paul conversion. Not necessarily a god. It could have been an epileptic seizure. Now, that was not something he created or caused, but it's not divine in origin. It's biological in its basis, but not brought upon himself. It was, you know, epilepsy. So he was passive, but it was not divine in origin. And then also we've got to ask, well, what about religious experiences brought upon by you? Say if you go to a, a place seeking a religious experience, well, what about Buddhist monks who meditate into that state? You, you seemingly can bring upon some sort of religious experience onto you, it could be argued. What about ineffability then? And this is the idea that they are inarticulate. You can't put into words what you've experienced. And you remember Wittgenstein, the limits of my language are the limits of my, my, uh, my world. All I know is what I have words for. So the idea that when you have a religious experience, you're not going to be able to explain it because you've never experienced it before. The limits of your language, your language is limited by your past 
by your knowledge, by your experience. And for a religious experience to be authentic, it's got to have come from a divine supernatural origin. If it's based on things you've experienced in the past, it could be your mind playing tricks on you. It could be an hallucination based on previous subconscious memories. It could be you making it up. But if you can't articulate it clearly, then how, how would you know about it unless it had literally happened uh, from outside of you? So that key, key idea that Wittgenstein was saying about our language limiting us, you know, the power of words. And if we can't articulate it, then surely it is from a supernatural origin because it's nothing we've experienced. Psychologists tell us that everything we experience in the world shapes us, it informs us, it uh, governs and uh, moulds, if you like, our thinking and our consciousness. If then you can't articulate something, it is something that happens to you that can't be articulated in words, chances are you've not experienced it before. It's something completely new. And whilst that doesn't prove it has to be divine in origin, it may make it a bit more likely that you're not just making it up and going a bit, bit, bit crazy, maybe, if I can put it like that. This is a nice chance, actually, when we're talking about how people describe their religious experiences, because ineffability would suggest you can't articulate what you've experienced. Be nice to bring in a bit of Richard Swinburne here, I think. And he said that there are two principles that we've got to take into account when we discuss the ideas of religious experiences. And they are the principle of testimony and the principle of credulity. And he said, right, we've got a principle of credulity. So Swinburne's principle, this is, that people should be believed unless we have a good reason to disbelieve them. So unless you've got a very good reason not to believe someone, you should believe what they're saying. So if they're telling you about this religious experience, unless you've got a good reason to doubt them, you should believe them. The idea, innocent until proven guilty. And then the principle of testimony his principle that people are in general truthful so that their testimony is generally truthful and that there need to be good reasons to doubt their honesty. So again, this idea that innocent until proven guilty, that we shouldn't just be writing people off. We should accept what they say unless we've actually got a good reason to doubt them, to question them. Really, really interesting idea then here from him. So on that ineffability, you know, is what somebody's saying to you making sense? When we hear about religious experiences, for Swinburne, we shouldn't question them unless we've got evidence. We should say, right, okay, we're going to accept this. And it's an interesting argument from him that puts into perspective how people do articulate them to us. Are they making it up? Has it got a biological, neurological, physiological explanation? Whilst we're on that, let's talk about that. Because these experiences and Swinburne saying we should just treat them as if they're genuine uh, unless we've got reason to prove somebody wrong they might not be divine in origin we've got that example of them being divine in origin but we could say okay they're psychological in origin Freud is our key thinker here the idea that um it's a neurosis of the mind that it's some sort of mental illness uh, a condition within the mind physiological Bertrand Russell is back Whoop, whoop. He said that if you eat too little, you have visions. He said if you drink too little, you see snakes. So what he was saying was that, well, if you change your biological state in any way, you might then have these visions. And you think you're seeing God, but really you just need a sausage roll. You know, this idea <laughs> that changes in our biological state, in our physiological state, can lead to hallucinations. Charles Stross, I love this quote, by the way. He said, let me just find the quote. He said, one ape's hallucination is another ape's religious experience. So the idea that we are just these biological mechanistic beings, really, and that whilst one people think this is a religious experience, to someone else, it's a hallucination. So it could be just biological, uh, psycho psychological in origin. Also, with corporate religious experiences, which is a religious experience where we see a large group of people sort of under this mass hysteria of all thinking they're encountering the divine. Is that just our human instinct to follow the crowd in order to conform? Is it actually an authentic religious experience? Like the Turan Toronto Mass Blessing, this um, supposed mass religious experience, 
Was everybody just following the crowd? Were we just getting caught up in that mass hysteria? Or was it authentic? So we've got to ask, okay, so this person is passive in the experience. They struggle to articulate it properly. But is it actually just delusional? Are they hallucinating? Is it physiological? You know, have they not eaten enough? Is it an illness like epilepsy when we saw St. Paul and his religious experience? One eighth hallucination is another eighth religious experience. Is it actually, actually, actually divine in origin? And one final point on um, ineffability. Ninian Smart, key thinker on religious experiences, she said that religious experience has its own kind of logic. She said, religious language cannot be reduced to other forms of discourse, adding it has its own peculiar and special structure. So for this idea about language describing religious experiences, Ninian Smart said very clearly it has its own peculiar and special structure. It cannot be reduced to other forms of discourse. So for it to be an authentic religious experience and therefore proving the divine, it would need to be inarticulate. It would transcend our usual and normal vocabulary and structures of discourse. Moving on then to transience. The idea here is that uh, the experiencer has the experience for a very short time, but the effects are life changing. Perfect example with this is St. Paul. He had his experience on the road to Damascus. Damascus. It was a short time. It wasn't for days and days and days, you know, this vision and hearing voices which maybe today we would see as epilepsy or, you know, some sort of hallucinations, some sort of medical illness. We have to bear that in mind. But the consequences of it were life changing. He then went on to become one of, I would say, the top five figures in Christian thought. He is one of those main, main people in the Christian faith. He has changed the course of human history, whether that was a religious experience or it was some sort of psychological condition so we've got to say transience the idea it takes place in a short amount of time but it has long lasting um consequences so for example with him it was conversion and then his consequential religious work writing and uh, evangelism so does the fact that it has positive effects prove its divine in origin for a lot of people they'd say yes uh, William James, for example, was a pragmatist, and that idea is that a theory is treated as true if it works satisfactorily in practice. So the consequences and the outcomes of that experience for St. Paul were arguably very, very positive. It stopped him persecuting the Christians and actually then promoting the faith on an unprecedented scale. Does that in itself prove the experience is valid? Does that prove the divine? Or can we just say it's a coincidence? Can we just say, well, yes, it changed the course of history. Yes, it made a difference. Yes, it changed his life. But that still doesn't prove it was divine in origin, because why aren't we all having these experiences, for example? Why does not every single person have that same experience and then change their life in the same way? Is it psychological, physiological, neuro neurological in origin? And then those consequences are just sort of a... Not chance, not a fluke, not a coincidence, but still not proving it's divine in origin. I could promote something, I could go off all crazy on this religion or this cause, and that's just a neurological condition, neurological thing, not necessarily divine in its first origin. And then finally, uh, no, we've done passivity, good lord. Finally, noetic quality. The idea that it gives a kind of knowledge unlike the knowledge of any other human experience. So this, I'm thinking Moses and his burning bush and his receival of the Ten Commandments, it gives knowledge that you can't attain. So as we've said, we attain knowledge through our senses all the time, all day, every day. We've got all this knowledge that we store in our minds that we've gained. For it to be an authentic religious experience for William James, that knowledge has got to transcend physicality. It's got to transcend what we usually know, see and witness. Um, and he said in his words, religious experiences are states of insight into depths of truth unplumed by the discursive intellect. Depths of truth, I love that. They are illuminations, revelations, full of significance and importance, 
all inarticulate, though they remain, so a look at the ineffability there, and as a rule carry with them a sense of authority for after time. So actually they're referencing to that uh, transience, the idea that they have authority going on and on. But the key point being there, that they give a state of insight they reveal something that you wouldn't already know. That would suggest that information is divine in origin because you can't know it, it through worldly means. It has to have had some greater supernatural source. And the idea that a purpose of religious experience is to reveal something. So, for example, when people have claimed to have seen the Virgin Mary, to have seen Jesus, to have seen God in some form, what is the actual information that they then take away from that? And is that finding, is what the legacy of that information they leave, the point of religious experience? Does that prove God exists? Because if you can't know it in this world, if it's this sort of noetic quality, it is a massive revelation. Where else can it have come from? Now, of course, we have got major, major criticisms of all of these points. We don't all have these experiences. Charles Stroth, hallucinations, Bertrand Russell, a physiological basis. Uh, Richard Dawkins, he said that faith is the great excuse to evade the need to evaluate experience. So we're just using it as an excuse. We need to actually get to the root of this. We just say, oh, it's a religious experience by God. What if it's actually a serious psychological condition? Why aren't we all having them? Um, do the consequences just prove it exists or does it have another cause? Uh, so many criticisms, so many critiques, especially today, we we see through psychology, a lot of people say, like Freud, it's neurosis, you know, a hallucination. Is it actually divine in origin? What, what are the causes of these experiences? We're now starting to delve into the mind, delve into the biology and ask what are the causes of these unique experiences? Is it ep epilepsy, which of course St. Paul wouldn't have known about? Is it uh, hunger? Is it some sort of illness or condition or is it genuinely a religious experience? And does that prove God exists? What are the key things that we take away from it? Saying, Do you know what? That proves God does exist. It's not just them delirious. It's not just them connecting with the divine. One very last point on religious experiences is Rudolf Otto. And he was commenting on the idea of them being mystical and numinous. So that idea of the numinous being something which makes us go, wow, a sense of there being something greater than us. And I thought that'd be nice just to finish on the idea religious experiences are mystical. They do transcend this world and they do overwhelm us. They make us feel a connection with the divine, with something greater. And that sort of sums up what a religious experience is, whether it's a conversion, whether it's a corporate experience, whether it is an encounter with the mystical and an overwhelming feeling of the numinous. This is what a religious experience is is all about. So there we have them. But of course, lots to question. Is Swinburne right that we should just accept people? Is James right in those four characteristics? Is Ninian Smart right about the different structures and ways of speaking? Strauss, Dawkins, Freud, all these key thinkers, what have they got to tell us about the debate on religious experiences? And why do only certain people have them with certain outcomes and consequences? Really interesting ideas. We've got one last bit to focus on now. Very exciting. I love this. This has to be my favourite topic in philosophy. The problem of evil. Because if proving that God exists wasn't enough, as in the ontological, the cosmological, the teleological arguments, if that wasn't enough to try and persuade people, not only do theologians then have to try and explain how that God, which they've struggled so hard to explain why he exists in the first place, they've got to then try and explain why he exists in a world with so much suffering. Because everywhere you look in our world, there is so much suffering. Thousands upon thousands of people killed every day in natural disasters, in homicides, in murder. It is really really awful as John Stuart Mill said as well nature kills we live in a world where nature itself is brutal is cruel Thomas Hobbes said the life of man is nasty brutish and short um T.H. Huxley said um said that there is a natural selfishness in nature and Richard Dawkins said, we alone on earth have the power to rebel against the tyranny of our selfish replicators. There is a lot of selfishness, a lot of 
evil going on day after day and how can that be reconciled with the existence of a god because god is supposedly omnipotent omnibenevolent uh, omniscient if he is and then suffering exists how can that be reconciled and uh alan platinga key really interesting philosopher said that a theodicy is the answer to the question of why god permits evil why is there evil and epicurus one of the key ancient greek philosophers uh big up aristotle and plato said this is god willing to prevent evil but not able then he is on um, he is not omnipotent is he able but not willing then he is malevolent. Is he able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? So that whole question encapsulated that. How do we explain that a God exists when there is evil and suffering? Is he not powerful enough to stop it? Is he not loving? So does he not care? Or does he not know about it? What is God and what is his relationship with the evil and suffering in his world. Now for a deist, so deism is the idea here, God can't, God wouldn't interfere. Deism is the idea that God just created the world and then steps back. He doesn't play an active role. But for Christian thinkers, for monotheistic thinkers, so for Islamic thinkers, Judaist thinkers, God plays an active role. That's why prayer is important why there is an ongoing relationship dynamic relationship and connection between creation and creator according to these religious traditions so our key thinkers here our theodicies if you like are both christian really key christian thinkers they are saint augustine and saint irenaeus both very early thinkers within the christian church so they were quick quick off the mark to talk about the Odyssey and to talk about how there could be a good, loving, powerful God and evil. We're going to start with Augustine because he had some very, very interesting thoughts. Augustine took a look at the fall in Genesis and this was an event where Adam and Eve were put in the Garden of Eden and there was perfect harmony between creator and creation. They had everything they could possibly want. They were immortal. They had all freedom because here's a key bit god gave them freedom he gave them free will because i quote augustine love this analogy because a runaway horse is better than a stone it is better to give people free will than to condition them and control them so they've got none john hick we'll talk about him when we talk about your name but really quickly he said that it is the loving thing to do to give free will because then the creation can choose to love the creator it's a free will thing. You don't have to do it. It wouldn't be love if you had to. But by choosing to love and worship the creator, that free will is used positively. But it would not be a loving thing to do for God to have created a controlled humanity. Free will is essential to Christian teaching. But he gave them free will. Back on track, back on track. Imagine yourself in the garden. We're in the garden of Eden. They have free will. And they misabuse that free will. They eat the apple. Now, Augustine believed that the whole of humanity was seemingly present in Adam's loins. So when he and Eve ate the apple, basically the whole of humanity was eating the apple with them because we seemingly were present in them. Now, biologists reject this. They say, come on, we're not all descendants from Adam and Eve. This is wrong. Evolution, for example, tells us the world was not started by a man and a woman in a garden, but evolution was a slow process from tiny microscopic organisms. But Augustine said we were seemingly present. And so we all brought suffering into the world. And he said that this act of betrayal, of turning their back on God, was what brought disharmony between the natural world and God. So harmony, everything's happy, everything's rosy, boom, they do that, disharmony, chaos, suffering, the pain of childbirth, death, and crucially, sin. And Augustine said that sin and evil are not a thing, because if they were an actual thing, then God would have had to have created them. And he said, no, God does not create evil. God is good. God would only ever create good. He said instead that evil is privatio boni. It is a privation of God. So like the darkness isn't a thing. So darkness isn't a thing. Interesting fact for you. Don't say we don't learn anything. Darkness isn't a thing. It's just an absence of light. And in the same way, Augustine said, 
evil isn't a thing in itself it's just an absence of God and that absence is brought about by turning away from God so really clever way for Augustine to say well God didn't create evil God didn't cause any of this it's all down to humanity it's all down to Adam and Eve and you were present in their loins so you are responsible so now you pay the price so he said that natural evil is brought about by the disharmony um, and the disunion that was caused by that betrayal in the garden and then moral evil is caused by a misabuse of free will but a runaway horse is better than a stone so that is how he explains it there is no such thing as evil it's an absence of good privacy or bonnie it is a privation it is not a thing it's not created by god he has no part in it it's all about human action causing suffering and God doesn't intervene because it is caused by human action. Uh, and it's all about that disharmony between nature. Now, Augustine said that that can be redeemed because by submitting to God, by following Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is sort of seen as the atonement. So if somebody that believes in Jesus, if follows him, he brings harmony, he brings forgiveness, atonement, a restoration in the covenant between man and God. He restores it. So he would then argue, St. Augustine, in the idea of election, of limited election. Certain people who choose to connect through Christ with God again will go to heaven. He then said, everyone else, bon voyage, you're off to hell. Now that's a real issue because if he's saying that evil is not a thing, God did not create evil, where's hell? Because surely God created hell, but if God doesn't create anything that's bad, what's going on there? Now, many theologians get around that. And remember, that's an AO2 criticism point. Many, criti uh, many theologians get around that by arguing that hell is not necessarily a place. Hell is, like evil, just an absence of good, an absence of God. So hell is not being in heaven. But it's not an actual place. It's just being outside of God's love. So heaven is the place. Good is the thing. Hell is the absence. Evil is the absence. It's being apart from God's grace. Being apart from God's love. And that's not what we want. Hell and goodness is what we want. But disharmony has been brought. Na uh, free will has been misabused. Natural evil, moral evil exist. Turmoil, chaos, unhappiness, responsibility on the human's shoulders. So much you can say about that, so much to evaluate and think about. It absolves God of all responsibility, places it all on the humans, and it forces us to do good. It says you are naturally inherently selfish. Now, a lot of scientists would agree with that. As I commented at the start, T.H. Huxley said there is a natural selfishness in nature. He was a key follower of Charles Darwin. And uh, Richard Dawkins, our modern, still alive, one of our only philosophers that we're covering that is still alive, and he's not even a philosopher, he's a scientist, uh, and he said that uh, we alone on earth have the power to rebel against the tyranny of our selfish replicators. We are in a selfish natural world. John Stuart Mill, nature kills. So this idea that there is inherent selfishness and unhappiness. Thomas Hobbes, we are naturally nasty, brutish and short. Uh, short. Yeah, life is nasty, brutish and short. So we're short. Not everybody. We've seen some of those basketball players. So <laughs> really, really interesting to look at that August Augustinian view that absolves God of all responsibility and takes those concepts of free will, of approbation, of hell, of uh, redemption through the figure of Jesus Christ as part of that theodicy and that theological answer to the existence of evil and suffering. Now, what I think is an evil, even more interesting theodicy is that of Irenaeus. Very, very interesting. And he again turned to Genesis, but he focused on a different bit. He focused on the act of creation itself. And he noted that Genesis says God created man in his image and in his likeness. Now, Irenaeus said, we are not, when we are born, in the image of God. He said it's not an instant thing. You know, like those instant quick fixes that you can get, you know, overnight beauty, overnight face mask, overnight quick fix to change your life. He said, that's not what happens. Instead, it is a process. It's all about the process and the journey. We, throughout our lives, become 
like God. We actually have to travel on a journey to become like God. It's not an instant product, an instant win, an instant buy. It's a process. It's a journey. And he said that it is through the events that we experience that we become like God, that we are strengthened. And here's the crucial bit, that we cultivate the virtues to become like God. So to cultivate things like patience, love, unconditional compassion, tolerance, humility, things like this. It is through life that we cultivate these. We're not born with them. We have to cultivate them. We have to become God-like. And it's only when we become God-like that Irenaeus says we get to heaven. So here's the important bit about the theodicy. How do we actually become God-like? And he said, listen up to this, that it is through evil and suffering that we become like God because it is our response to evil and suffering. So evil and suffering are seen as like a teacher, as a challenge, as a test for us. And they are used to test us, to challenge us and to force us to grow as people. Uh, so it's the idea that out of suffering grows miracles. Say so Ansel, shout out, he said that disasters teach us humility. The idea that every bad thing that happens, God comes out of it. And the idea here is that it is instrumental. So evil is used to achieve something good. It is an instrumental entity. It has an outcome, an aim, an objective. And for Irenaeus, everybody will go to heaven because they will eventually achieve that godlike status. Even if it's in like a purgatory state, even if it is after death, everybody will finally get there. But during your time on earth, you have these challenges, you have these struggles, you have this evil to overcome. And in the face of that, as a response to that, you have to cultivate the antidotes, the opposite to them. So in the face of suffering, you develop resilience, tolerance, compassion, love, forgiveness, humility. But you can only cultivate these through enduring that suffering and through enduring those trials. And there's a really nice little quote from Richard Swinburne. He's back and we're going to be talking about him in a bit more too. A bit more too. In a little bit too. And he said, we would never learn the art of goodness in a world designed as a complete paradise. We would never learn the art of goodness in a world designed as a complete paradise. So if everything was perfect, how would we cultivate those Christian virtues? How would we become good people. In today's world, we see goodness as being compassionate, being resilient, being tolerant, you know, being unconditional and giving love. That is the message of Christ. If you had everything handed to you on a plate, if everything was easy, how would you learn these? It is out of suffering that grow these miracles. It is out of those challenges that you can cultivate what we see as authentic goodness, as true morality. So personally, I do quite like the idea I do agree with a lot of the criticisms to come, but I like this idea that we use suffering as a vehicle. And actually, Buddhism teaches this a heck of a lot too. So it's not just Christianity. It has got a lot of value to people that we actually do use these awful events to become stronger, to become better people. In the face of that pain, of that suffering, we can become stronger people. And that is for Irenaeus to become Godlike and that universal salvation. Everybody is then saved. Everybody goes to heaven. Now, of course, we have got criticisms. But before we do, I want to introduce to you a modern theodicy uh, in the Irenaean tradition from John Hick. I told you we'd be back. And he again said, we're not created perfect. It is about this journey. He agreed with Irenaeus there. And we have to grow into the uh, likeness of God. We're not born with it. It's not that instant buy. It's a slow process. It's, uh, you know, like one of those really long repayment schemes that keeps going and going. It's one of them. It's a journey that we go through. Uh, John Hick agreed. Everybody is saved. Universal salvation. Some people will make their souls in purgatory. If they don't do it in time in life. They've not had enough challenges. They've not become good people. They've got a chance in purgatory, he believes, to do that. And it's really important to note that this theodicy is known as a soul-making theodicy. The whole point of life is to create a good soul. 
excuse me, it's all about that journey to having a good moral soul and a good sense of yourself. That is what this human life is about according to this theodicy. Um, and because of the fall, we're down here. The fall is back. But through disasters and evil and suffering, you cultivate that tolerance, those virtues, and you become that stronger entity and individual again. That is the idea. Uh, and Richard Swinburne, we've mentioned him, he is a key thinker on this idea. He was very passionate about instrumentalism, the idea that we use evil as a vehicle, as a tool to become better, stronger people. And uh, first of all, I just want to give you a bit more on John Hick. I think it's important we do him justice. He said that the suffering you experience is justified by the future so we said that the future is good enough and great enough so actually getting to heaven having this good soul having these good virtues being a compassionate loving person this is great enough the reward is good enough to justify what happens on the way so you know these terrible events that happen the consequences the ultimate outcome is good enough so it's quite teleological if we're talking about those ethical theories. It's all about the outcome. They're used as the vehicles, as the catalysts for change, progress and development in yourself. And John Hicks said humans need genuine freedom, as we said, because then they can choose to love their creator. He can't program you like Augustine. A runaway horse is better than a stone. But genuine love, worship, connection, it's got to be authentic. It can't be programmed or controlled. He said the only relationship worth having with God is one brought about by personal choice through free will. Um, and he said that God gives, key word here, epistemic distance. He wants to allow his individual creation to come to their own conclusions. So epistemic distance. He's not always involved. He's given them reason. He's given them responsibility. He's given them consciousness. And then he creates distance. So if they then do choose to bring evil into the world, they choose to do bad things, that's the consequence of that. It's a loving thing to do because it means you can choose to love him. But it has the consequence that you could choose to do bad with it. And that's because of the epistemic distance that he doesn't have that control and knowledge of what you as that individual are then going to do because because of love he's created a distance but then we have Richard Swinburne as we've said and his idea of instrumentalism uh, and his belief that God has not created a toy world where he's like you know the little child playing with the toy soldiers doing this 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 and this instead he is very much stepping back and giving free will. Richard Swinburne said that God cannot be, here's your quote, the overprotective parent who will not let his child out of sight for a moment. God is not going to be watching over you all the time. He takes a step back. He gives you responsibility for that free will and then you can misabuse that, that epistemic distance. You can then do things which do cause suffering and harm. But that's because of free will. There is that gap that's created out of love, giving you that responsibility. And Swinburne also said that there are many natural evils which allow us to know what evil is. Because without these, we wouldn't understand evil. Because you could argue that without knowing what evil is, you don't know what goodness is. You know, you wouldn't be able to tell right from wrong if you didn't know what they both were. So they're actually necessary to understand goodness and to then be able to cultivate it. So criticism time, you could say it's so unjust, you know, a child dying of cancer. Oh, well, the parents are going to learn from it. It's it brutal. It's quite nasty. Why would a God need to create the suffering in the first place? Why don't we just have those virtues straight away? Uh, why is there a need to cultivate them anyway? What is actually the purpose of life if it's just about cultivating virtues? If we're all going to be saved anyway, why cultivate them on earth? If we're going to have that salvation, who cares? Do it in purgatory. Do what you want when you want now. You could still argue on the free will situation. You know, well, hang on. God has still got some knowledge of what's happening because if there are these challenges and trials and tribulations, then he's got some power over what's going on. And then DZ Phillips was not happy, to say the least. He said that what Swinburne was saying and the others in that tradition were actually adding to the evils that they sought to justify. 
So he saw it as absolutely appalling that they were trying to say, yeah, Eva, it's just used to help you grow. He thought it was absolutely scandalous. I do feel the song coming on. And he said that we cannot speak of moral growth in this way. That is his key point. We cannot speak of moral growth in this way. He was absolutely appalled by what Swinburne was saying. He said, no, it cannot be instrumental. He said, you cannot say that the suffering of other people is instrumental to help you. He looked at the suffering. And he said, it's not right. Whatever you get out of it, whatever you need to grow from, a loving God in his mind would not do that. He would not use people as like a means to an end, using people as a tool to achieve something else. Because the torture, for example, the Holocaust, how can you justify that happening? You say, well, it helped us all grow. But look at the sound of the people who died. Look at all the suffering that actually happened. How can that, in any context, be justified by a loving God? How? That's what he wanted to know. He said, you cannot justify evil in this way. You cannot say moral growth in this way justifies the appalling evil because that torture is bad in itself. No matter if somebody gets some resilience, some compassion out of it, look at the act. Look at the Holocaust, look at war, look at natural disasters and the price people pay. You know, if someone died, what do they get out of it? If you're in mourning, what do you get out of it? Surely that isn't compatible with the idea of a loving God. And remember, that is what theodicy is all about. I feel we have been on quite a whistle-stop tour through the philosophy of religion for AS level. But thank you so, so much for your company. It's been a real pleasure. And I do hope you've got something out of it. Remember, do keep revising, keep revising your key quotes and look out for the key uh, word revision coming here to YouTube very soon. I'm Ben Wardle. Follow me on Twitter at Ben Wardle UK. Have a good day. Bye bye.